Hello, House Church family. Anna Ervolino here. Delighted to be with you for the weekly video. First of all, I want to say hello to everyone and thank you for being at our Je Jesus Disciple Conference that just concluded. And can you believe what God is doing with this new discipleship? I tell you what, I got word that already we have over 600 people that have created profiles and are beginning to engage with our new discipleship. And I just want to encourage you house church leaders, house church attendees, step into what God is doing with discipleship. Get on the app. Um, check it out, um, form a group, just be led by God in this season to just uh, jump in full force with what God is doing with discipleship. So thanks for being at the conference. And if we didn't see you at the breakout session or um, get to chat with you, we sure love you. So grateful for what God is doing in and through our house churches continually. And I just greet you and hope you find yourself just full of joy today as you gather. I want to go into just a little bit of time of preparing our hearts for giving. You know, there was this situation um, the other day. My husband and I were out to dinner with some of um, our business partners that we we are in partnership for my husband's business and we were sitting at dinner and kind of winding our time down together and we get this phone call from our oldest son who had been surfing at Doheny Beach um, longboard surfing with one of his buddies and he called once and I didn't pick up I was thinking oh maybe he forgot we were at dinner so I didn't pick up then I get a second call from another number that I didn't recognize so I didn't pick it up and then a third time I was like okay something's going on um so I pick up the phone and uh, recognize that my son his voice is on the other line and he just says mom I got robbed mom we got robbed and he said um, that while they were surfing, they got out of the water and some men, like older guys that were intoxicated, just roaming the beach, had taken all their belongings. And um, the guys were wearing their clothes because they were in their wetsuits from surfing and the guys had put their garments on and were walking around. They had my son's um, cell phone. Um, so, and he, he didn't have any access to anything. He had just cashed his first paycheck from work and had put even $100 cash in his pocket of those pants. And we were like, what is going on? So my husband and I rode down quickly. We weren't too far from the beach. We rode down quickly. The cops had gotten there. It turns out these guys were taking stuff from people all along the beach. They apprehended the guys and they were in um, custody there but they still couldn't find my son's belongings. The men had started to um, toss everything that they had taken into bushes. And so we were thankful that they were okay. And we ended up retrieving all of our son's belongings. Um, someone who was searching for their own car keys that had been taken found my son's phone in the bushes. And um, so while we were there, we got everything back. And um, I have a story to tell, but I was thinking about that um, that word when he just said, Mom, I got robbed. And I wanna just encourage you today as we prepare our hearts for giving. Um, there is a scripture in Malachi 3.8, and it's firm, but it uses the same language. Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. And then asks, how are we robbing you? In your tithes and offerings. And this is what um, the warning is, do not live this way. It's like, imagine um, the tithe is the first 10% of all your increase. And I'm just thinking of this guy robbed my son and put on his garment. He was wearing my son's clothes. And we do that by not offering to God what is God's. We're walking around spending and wearing and using what belongs to him. So I wanna encourage our hearts today as we give. I know it's a strong text, but I've been transformed by strong words about giving. And that's why I live in the abundance of God's provision. And I want that for every believer. There is a way and it is a blessed life. So I wanna pray for you that we will not rob God. We will not let fear or, or anything keep us from giving to God what is rightfully his. So let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we know it's a strong word 
But God, you have so much for your people. And I pray today that we will be faithful to bring to you what belongs to you. And we will trust you with our lives, with our finances. Lord, we know that if you have this area of our heart, man, everything flows from this. So Lord, I pray a blessing on your people as they give today. I pray they'd give in joy and confidence that you shall supply all their needs according to, according to your riches and your glory in Christ Jesus. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Now we're gonna watch this video on how you can give. Giving to the Rock Network or Solid Lives is easy. For the safety of our leaders and attendees, all giving in house churches is done electronically. We never collect physical offerings. The most convenient way to give is through one of our apps. You can download either the Rock app or the Solid Lives app on your app store. For the Rock app, just search for Go to the Rock. And for the Solid Lives app, search for Solid Lives. You can also easily give through one of our websites, either go to the rock.com or solidlives.com. On either the app or the website, simply click Give and then select House Churches. Then choose your state and city, or state or city not listed. Thank you so much for honoring God and partnering with us to build solid lives that build solid lives. Okay, thank you so much for sowing into the kingdom. I'm telling you, these are glorious days to put our trust in God with our giving. So I also wanna head straight into our teaching today. I'm gonna do something a little different for these next weeks of teaching, and I wanna give you a little um, insight into it. You know, as house church leaders, um, you're gathering there um, in your home and your place of work, and it's so easy to feel like, um, I don't know how to, to teach and lead or or do this type of, a, um, I don't know, like bringing the word to my house church. So I am going to, for the next few weeks, kind of model to you a simple way of teaching through the Bible. And so you can take a group of texts, a group of verses, read them, and then talk about them there in your house church. And I'm telling you, you'll find that the Holy Spirit will illuminate the word and cause many people to weigh in and have such a brilliant conversation regarding the word of God. And you would just be so surprised as you center around the word and ask some pointed questions, what God could produce in the midst of you as you study the word. So we're going to be in the book of John. And in my quiet time this past week, I was just seeking the Lord and just um, in his presence and just enjoying him and bringing some concerns I had for some things I'm facing. And I just sat there and I just was waiting on the Lord, just listening for his voice. And I heard in my spirit, he says, eat of me and drink of me. And I was like, okay. And that was his comfort to my heart. Just eat of me and drink of me. And it reminded me instantly of the passage in John 6 called I am the bread of life. So we're going to focus there and I'm going to share with you out of that text. It's it's remarkable. So you ready? Let's dive in. Lord, I pray your power would be felt as we read these words, God. And I pray that in the house churches that are gathering right now that you would do something among us, Lord. That you would meet your people through your word. It's living and active. Come now, Holy Spirit, and just light it up for us. In your light, we see light. I thank you that you have met with us and will expand the word in our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm in verse 22 of John 6. Its um, heading is, I am the bread of life. And it says, this, this is right after Jesus feeds the 5,000. And we actually did that in a series recently. So this is on the heels of that. Then he walks on water. And then we enter the scene after that great miracle. So it says, On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after, after the Lord had given thanks. 
So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. So there we just read the text. And I want to read through um, just some description of what's going on and some insight into these scriptures. That same morning, back on the east side of the lake, the crowd gazed intently over the water to see if Jesus had escaped by boat during the night, but saw only one small boat that wasn't his. They knew he had not gotten into the boat. He sent his disciples away the night before, and that morning they had searched the area but couldn't find him. So they decided to go to Capernaum and to look for him. John also reports that either the night before or early that same morning, a group of people from Tiberias, a city on the west side of the lake, had arrived in small boats to search for Jesus. But when they discovered that he was no longer there, they got back in their boats and taking some of the crowd with them, headed toward Capernaum to look for him. But the boat carrying Jesus and his disciples didn't return to Capernaum. It came to shore about two miles southwest of Capernaum at a small agricultural valley called Gennesaret. But Jesus couldn't find rest from the crowds there either. As soon as the local people recognized him, they ran out to get those who were sick and brought them to Jesus. And that began a powerful ministry event. Matthew and Mark report that everyone who touched him that day was made well. Meanwhile, the crowd who had eaten the loaves and fish the day before were sailing or walking around the north end of the lake until they finally caught up with him. Still curious as to how he had escaped them, they asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? And that started a remarkable discussion, which thankfully John recorded in this text. The crowd tried to persuade Jesus to give them more bread. But he refused. He told them they were asking for the wrong kind of bread and seeking to satisfy the wrong kind of hunger. He said, you seek me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were fed. In other words, they recognized that he had spiritual power, but did not understand the spiritual meaning of the miracles he was performing. Some of them had walked for miles to get there, and others had sailed across the lake to find him, but all they wanted was more bread. Jesus told them that the zeal and energy they were using to pursue food which perishes would be far better spent pursuing the food which remains into eternal life. By food, he meant the knowledge of truth which leads to salvation. He wanted them to be more concerned with being right with God than finding a free meal. Then Jesus again identified himself as the Son of Man, which, as we saw earlier, is a title that refers to the powerful figure in Daniel's prophecy who will be given complete dominion over all the earth at the end of the age. And because he was the Son of Man, Jesus said he was the one who makes it possible for human beings to have eternal life. In chapter 5, we heard him announce himself as the one who will actually call the dead to life and will sit on judgment, the judgment seat over all humanity. To support his right 
to make such claims, he added the statement, for the Father God sealed this one. In that culture, seals were a very common part of life. When someone carried a seal, they carried with them the authority of the person who sent them. Or the contents of a container might be sealed to ensure that nothing had been removed or changed. A seal was a mark that showed approval. And since Jesus was making staggering claims about himself, he didn't ask people to believe those claims without seeing some forms of indisputable proof. And he reminded the crowd that he had seen such proofs, that they had seen such proofs. Though John doesn't list those forms of proofs here, the gospels contain numerous ways that God had set his seal on Jesus, a voice from heaven. The impartation of the Holy Spirit, John the Baptist's testimony, the miracles Jesus performed, and the prophecies he fulfilled. And of course, the greatest confirmation of all was yet to come, his resurrection from the dead. But the seals the crowd in Gennesaret could have recognized at that point in time would have been his miracles and the prophecies he was fulfilling. Yet surprisingly, the crowd that day did not hear in his words a call of faith. Instead, they focused on the word work, which he used when he said, do not work for the food which perishes. They asked him what sort of religious works they needed to do in order to please God, to which Jesus answered, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who, whom he sent. We learn from this that there is a work that humans who hear the gospel must do to be saved. It is the choice we make to exercise faith in Jesus Christ. He did not say, there is no work you can do because salvation is accomplished entirely by God. Nor did he give them a list of to-dos and don'ts and then admonish them to try to, for them trying to earn their salvation. He simply said in effect, your responsibility is to respond in faith to what I'm telling you. His answer to them reveals a profound truth. Humans must exercise faith to be saved, but no human effort earns salvation. Our part in the process is to believe when God shows us the truth, to believe. The crowd responded to Jesus' invitation to believe in him by demanding more proof. They said, what then you do for a sign that we may see and believe you? What work do you do? But the next statement they made revealed their true motive. They hoped to trick him into producing more bread. Their challenge to him was that if he really was the second Moses, the prophet like himself that Moses had promised, then he could surely provide them with manna from heaven like Moses had. They even quoted scripture to support their demand, trying, uh, implying that it was Moses rather than God who gave bread to Israel. Jesus immediately corrected this false assumption by saying, I say to you, Moses has not given you the bread out of heaven, but my father gives you the true bread out of heaven. God was Israel's source, not Moses. But then Jesus took the image of manna and explained that God has always intended it to point to something beyond his provision for their physical hunger. He warned, he wanted Israel to see in that miracle a promise that he would provide for their spiritual hunger as well. The bread that would fill their hunger for eternal life would be an unearned gift from heaven, just as manna had been. Then Jesus goes on to begin to identify himself as that bread, the bread of life. For he said, the bread of God is the one coming down out of heaven and giving life to the world. This is the bread of life. I love how even he uh, reiterates that Moses wasn't the one who supplied manna from heaven. It is God. God is the bread of life. God, Jesus, this is the bread of life. And I feel when I, I woke up that morning and the Holy Spirit said, eat of me and drink of me. It was saying, all your sufficiency is found in me. I am the source. I am what you want to know what to do in your current circumstances. Come to me eat of me, drink of me, I will satisfy the hunger. Because it's really birthing out of a hunger, a longing in us that says there must be more. What I'm needing, I, nothing is touching 
and satisfying this need in my heart. It is truly um, the bread of life that we need. So this is just an example of what it's like to just take a portion of scripture, read it out together, and then study out what, what's being said here. Now, what I want to invite you to do there in your house church today is, after we've just read this passage together, and I want to include the kids and youth. If you're a teenager in the room, if you're a young person in the room, engage in this conversation when we ask, what does this teach us about Jesus? What does this text here teach us about Jesus? So I want you to break off and turn this video off and begin to dialogue around this portion of text and let the Spirit of God speak to your hearts. And I pray that it just is a dynamic conversation there in your home. So Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word that is living and active. And I just pray right now, Father, that something would transpire in the conversations in the houses and the gatherings centered around your word that is more than we could imagine. Would you come and be present among them as they have a conversation? And 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 I thank you, Lord, for the young ones um, just bringing to the table what they're hearing about Jesus and, and what does this reveal about Jesus. So thank you for this time, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.